women in social housing, we're here to um, support, empower and, and, and enable greater networking for women in social housing. So at the end of this session, we're going to allow our speakers to leave um, and um, everybody else to stay as you wish, if you wanted to say hello to one another, because we can't be in the room together properly, but it would be lovely if we could all say a better hello than just, hello, this is me and this is where I'm coming from in the chat. Um, so the video that we, we just shared from um, Pobble gave a, a flavour of what placemaking can be to some people in some communities. Um, the purpose of today was to, to challenge um, our speakers to talk around a theoretical question of what, who wins in placemaking uh, between the tensions of, of costs and communities. Um, so today um, we are joined by three Brilliant speakers. Um, the first of those is Elaine from Bristol City Council. Um, Elaine has um, not long been in post at Bristol. She's head of housing delivery with a huge portfolio. She's a uh, chartered architect, sorry, with over 20 years experience coming from um, some really interesting positions uh, within the industry uh, with a huge range of experience across schools, community buildings, stadia and housing. Um, so she's got a wealth of experience to bring to bear today. Um, she's, she's worked a lot in the southwest with registered providers and national house builders and I'm really excited to introduce her today. Um, so rather than introduce everybody at, at, in one go, I think I'm going to pass on to Elaine. Um, and uh, thank you Elaine for joining us today. Um, when Elaine speaks, if I could ask everybody else to um, turn your camera off please. Thank you. Thank you, Megan, for the introduction. That was brilliant. So I'm going to now share my screen and hopefully take you through my little presentation for today. Um, so um, I recently, as Megan said, well, about a year ago, I joined the council as head of housing delivery. Um, the, and the housing delivery team was set up on the back of the cor corporate commitment regarding housing delivery. I'll just see if I can get my, my next slide. Wh which screen are you seeing? You're seeing the wrong screen, I think. Let me try again. Try that. Can someone let me know if you can see my screen, the one with the cursor? You're all good, Elaine. Brilliant, thank you. So the housing delivery team is a multifaceted team working on housing delivery in the city. We have a wide range of complementary skills and experience. We draw on experience across the council's other teams, such as the planning team, the urban design team, landscape architecture, and also the property team. So to you guys, that would be the land team, the legal team, highways team, um, and we work with um, the teams to help facilitate um, delivery in the city. Um, we de-risk council-owned land for disposal to RPs, the open market, um, community groups and our housing development company Gorham Homes. Um, we work on our direct delivery programme as well of new council homes. Um, the housing enabling team works with RPs and developers to facilitate housing delivery in this city. So there is an increasing recognition that the public and the commercial sectors um, recognise now the financial um, value to quality placemaking and good design, both in terms of, of driving development value and the speed of, of sales and, and housing delivery. So what is quality placemaking and urban design all about? And, and why is it important for councils as well as the private sector? Um, you know, urban design, it's essentially about good planning, optimizing and reconciling um, social, economic and environmental benefits um, from development opportunities. So we need to look at and recognize the common attributes that quality places share. So. Let's look at the past. Everyone will recognize these photos, not specific places per se, but I'm sure you will recognize the design responses. It's places we've all seen and all experienced. 
dead spaces, no real connections, dead ends, dark alleys and unsustainable communities. It's lack of natural surveillance, it's lack of wayfinding, or it's retrofitted interventions to provide solutions that, to problems that could have been avoided if they had been designed out. So in the past, you know, placemaking wasn't maybe the main priority. Planning teams work through policy, not from an urban design standpoint. And external developers often had more resource and local authorities to inform the urban environment. So things went through that potentially shouldn't have went through. But I think this is this contrasts to today where within local authorities, there is a bit more interest and more control. So what do we mean by quality places and quality placemaking? It's not just about fronts and backs. Commonly agreed attributes and objectives of quality placemaking are now part of our working landscape. They're referred to in local policies, national design guides, building for life, etc. This is the language we use now every day. This is great. Efficient land use is about optimizing density, but carefully balancing built form landscape, green infrastructure. I'm really sorry about the dogs, if you can hear them barking. Movement, um, but and not cramming it in. So there is a balance. That holistic overview is really important. Drawing on local context, linkages, and the constraints both on a macro and um, micro levels. Designs coding was something the private sector used to do, um, but it's now a tool that both the private sector and councils can use to plan, test and deliver good quality places. Again, that's got to be good news. There's a way forward. Different settings and constraints lead to different design responses. Local authorities, again, now are better at responding to this than they used to be. We recognize one size does not fit all in terms of density or design responses. And equally, one design response or one good idea doesn't fit every community. There are as many varieties of community aspiration as there are site settings and design responses. So what can we do as local authorities and private developers with the communities we are working in? We can engage. We can co-design and we can listen. Often communities don't have a voice or they feel they don't have a voice. Development happens around them or to them. Um, we as developers, both in the public and the private sectors, we can change that. Better engagement often leads to better design. It can be slower, but it will often be better. So looking at that bigger picture is also important, that sort of city-wide or county-wide the linkages across the aesthetic, the built form, the public realm, but also the linkages with the private realm and how it all hangs together. These are all integrated and linked. Um, and the more we can think about them together as a piece, the better developments will be. It's our responsibility to understand those linkages and ask the right questions and provide the right solutions. Um, some local authorities, sorry. Oh, sorry, goodness. Um, some local authorities build on their own land um, and some don't. Bristol does. This is an example of one of our, our sites. Um, we are developing on land all over the city and we have a strong pipeline. Um, we expect good design from the private sector and we want to set the bar high, um, but we need to lead by, by example and we're doing that. Placemaking, aesthetics, environmental performance, materials, life cycle costings. They're all really important bits of the jigsaw puzzle, and it is part of the design work that we do as an authority. Think big, yes. I'd like to think we do. We can look at things and sites just in isolation, but that's not a good design response. It's about wider community integration, linkages, and overall benefits across the city and communities that we work in. It's about taking new ideas and sometimes from left field, allowing community groups to speak, make proposals and offer solutions. This project on the screen is Glencoin Square in Southmead. It would not have been possible without the community leading the way. This is uh, an affordable development of 122 new homes. It's, uh, it's with uh, an RP 
um, and a South Mead Development Trust, and they're pushing it forward. It was an underutilized piece of green space, but it's going to kick off a larger regeneration of the Arnside area in South Mead. It's not always about big. It's sometimes, and well, it is about, it's about the right solution for the right problem. This is our smallest community led project. So it's micro plots in the backs of back gardens in council homes in Knowall. And it, again, it's being pushed by a community um, organization for people within the locality that are most in need. We're hoping the first two will start on site really, really soon. So we're nearly at the end of the presentation. Um, what are the benefits and rewards? Well, we build communities with distinct identities. Contextual design and materials are used to inform design. So that could be contextual as in the place itself, or it could be contextual in the aspiration. We create places where people want to live. That's one of the most important things. We deliver buildings that help sustain and create communities, active spaces, active places, safe feeling streets, places where people want to be. But also we get the best out of the land, we get efficient design. But with that comes designs that suit the setting and suit the community. So one solution does not fit every site, location or community. We know that and that's what we aspire to. The ultimate goal is balanced, vibrant and sustainable communities. So that leads me to um, a close. So I hope you find that informative um, and I'd welcome any questions. And I'm just about to stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Elaine. I think um, I'm going to um, try and um, keep questions towards the latter end of the, the session, if that's OK with everybody. Um, and um, that was a, such a wide ranging look at what we can do um, and what local authorities can do to, to push place making agenda forward. Um, and it leads very nicely into our second architect's view today. Um, and I'm going to introduce um, Rob Delius from Stride Tregau. I'm delighted to introduce Rob today. Um, all of our speakers are glittering careers and, and Rob's been uh, awarded quite a few awards I can see from um, from what I have in front of me, uh, including uh, award-winning residential projects in Somerset, um, Reba competitions, and um, looking across the country. Um, he, he's also focused on initiatives looking at well-being, placemaking, and sustainability. I'm delighted to have Rob here. Stride Trigrounds, a, a shining light in Bristol and, and across the country in, in looking at placemaking. Uh, and I'm constantly impressed at the work that that practice um, provides. Um, Rob, um, if I can pass on to you, I will try and share your presentation if you'd like to unmute. Thank you, Megan, uh, and thank you for the uh, really nice introduction. And um, thank you to Elaine for really setting the scene so well in terms of what placemaking is all about. Um, so I'm just going to do a quick run through. I mean, um, Megan's asked me to answer these two questions. And as she said, Stride Clown, we, we do a whole range of building types, but we do, and, and I particularly focus on residential design and master planning. And I'm going to be talking to you just about a few projects that we've been doing. So if you go to the next slide, please, Megan. So I thought I'd start actually by talking about what placemaking is. And Elaine's done a really good overview um, of what it, what it is all about. But I suppose from my personal perspective, I think that when I uh, think of placemaking, and it is quite a buzzword at the moment, um, but so one, one wonders what does it actually mean and how as a designer can you create a great place? And for me, it's about two things, really. One is creating a distinctive place, so one that's sort of identifiable from another, which is something that Elaine touched on. Um, so developing that character, which or the, the characteristics of that place. And the second aspect is about almost like 
space making rather than place making. So it's about creating places where they're not just through routes, they're places where people want to stay, they want to linger, they're places where there's opportunities for people to uh, get together and, well, essentially create a community. Um, as soon as you get people knowing your neighbours, um, then you start to create a community. So for me, that's what sort of good place making is all about. So next slide, please, Megan. This sort of uh, view might be familiar to many of you, and, and Elaine showed some similar examples of across the UK, there are places like this, um, and this, this happens to be in, in Manchester, but there are every UK city has sort of places like this. They're monotonous and repetitive, and you can see from the layout, you know, it's completely road dominated. There's very little uh, green space. There's very little place to go just to meet your neighbours. Um, and, and luckily, we don't we we don't seem to be sort of doing this too much these days. But um, we need to learn from these mistakes, from the kind of uh, the bad developments of say the the, the 60s, 70s, 80s, which were all about the road. Um, and, and notice on this as well, there's no sort of street trees within here. So there's very little public space, public quality space. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, so if you think it's bad in the UK, it's actually very bad in other places. So th this is actually the town where my mother-in-law lives in uh, Canada. And although this isn't a residential setting, but you can see just the uh, kind of the abysmal state that some places are in, in terms of placemaking, it's an absolute sea of tarmac. Um, there's really no distinctiveness or green space. And, you know, this, this is where we would go shopping. And this is kind of the average experience for many people over there. And, and I put this is why kind of local planning authorities and planners are so important, because without their input, this is can be what happens. So, you know, I'm always the planner is our friend in terms of actually um, maintaining that kind of level of quality. Uh, next slide, please. And it's, it's not just in Canada. Um, we happen to have a, a friend who lives in, in the suburb in Los Angeles. And this is quite a sort of horrifying picture as well of a residential area, which is extremely dense and density can be good, but not when it's done like this, where there's just no green space and there's no space to go. And in fact, if you look at the houses as well, there's virtually no um, back gardens as well. And it's just completely uh, a sea of, of tarmac and of roads. Uh, next slide, please. So at the kind of other end of the spectrum, um, some examples, an example from Europe and from uh, very close to where I live um, in Bath, which is a village called Marshfield. Um, th this is where actually uh, placemaking really works in that the kind of scale of the development makes it somewhere where people can meet, they can linger. Uh, I like the way on the, in the village, there's a little bench outside that house. You know, you can imagine people having a conversation there. It, it's places where people feel safe from, you know, there will be cars passing through that street, but they'll probably be driving very slowly. So what can we learn from these sort of places? Next slide, please. So um, the next few slides are from a development we've done down in Totnes called Baltic Wharf. And it's actually in a quite a sensitive historic setting. So the top left is um, a sketch of the, the local high street, which is not too far from the site, about 10 minutes walk. And you can see it has a really fantastic kind of texture and pedestrian quality to it. It has a very close uh, sort of urban grain as well. So, most of our modern developments are very much built around the scale of a car. So we've got wide, wide roads and we don't have that sort of sense of scale where people can meet each other. So we try to look at on this project how we could um, pick up on some of that. So the, the sketch in the bottom left hand corner is of a street coming into the development that we've proposed, which tries to sort of echo some of the qualities of the top left picture. And then when you come into the development, which is in the bottom right hand picture, popping through that gap, you come into kind of like a central space there. Um, and then the top right picture is as you kind of weave through the development. So trying to create uh, places which people can meet. 
if you go to the next slide, please. And, and that's, um, you know, what I'm delighted to say it does happen. So the right hand picture is where residents held, held a party within that space. Um, and on the left hand side, another part of that development, which was originally planned for a co-housing group, um, but unfortunately they didn't um, manage to move in in the end, but the, the design was retained. But as you can see, this is, this is not a road, it's a space and it, it creates that kind of sense of community and, and the scale of it has, has a kind of nice feel about it. If you go to the next slide, please. And, and this development being called Baltic Wharf, it used to be uh, Timber Wharf um, and getting its timber from the Baltic. So that was something that part of the development we wanted to really play on from the distinctiveness point of perspective. So the bottom picture is one part of the site and, and this part feels a bit more kind of industrial. It, um, it pays homage to the buildings which were on the site, which from the middle there, which were big kind of wharf buildings. And then further down from the site, you've got some big kind of warehouse buildings. So we were kind of using the, the, the timber, we were using the stone in the base of that to create something which felt like it belonged to the site. And then in the top pitch, not a great um, photo, but as it was under construction shows how we're trying to mimic the architecture from the, the Baltic area which is the picture in the middle and the picture from the kind of high street next door which is the picture on the right hand side so it's not saying we have to um, be a slave to that architecture but it's just using those as reference points to create something with a strong character next slide please so um and, and other projects which we've done so the, the Fish Ponds Road one for Bristol Community Land Trust and Paintworks Phase 3 for Cress Nicholson um, the, these are projects where we've explored if you can take cars out of the street scene and you can replace it with with landscaping it creates a much better environment to create a community create a place um, which is good for people next slide please and, and this is something we've been uh, exploring on a bigger scale this was a competition entry which we were sort of one of a handful of entries which were shortlisted from an international selection looking at a um, whole neighbourhood in Letchworth, and it's probably quite hard to see from the master plan, but um, each of the housing areas are little clusters rather than streets, clusters around green spaces. So it was all um, a, a kind of network of green spaces rather than roads. So we're trying to um, play down the importance of the car and shaping the, the neighbourhood and the place and the community but creating places where people can get to know their neighbours. So for example, on the right hand side, we put the greenhouses in the middle of the kind of street. So it's taking activities which would normally be sort of hidden away and making them very public. Next slide, please. And um, a project which we completed for Live West in Bristol um, is, is the Sid, Sid, uh, Sidford Road scheme, where we um, had a lot of engagement with the local community to find out what sort of developments they wanted and they were very keen on something which faced the park which previously all the houses around didn't they wanted something which created spaces which you can see in the left hand side that's what we're tr trying to do and they wanted something which um, incorporated features which reflected the local um, locality so it's quite hard to see from the picture on the top right hand slide the entrance canopies incorporate a motif of a teasel, um, which is was a local kind of distinctive uh, plant, which was found a lot. And, and just through that engagement and finding out those were the things that they really liked, it, it sort of incorporated something which has made it very distinctive. Next slide, please. But it's not all just about um, engaging with residents and communities sort of before um, projects. We need to go back and learn what's worked and, and what people like and, and we've got an initiative at Strife's Clan called Inhabitant where we go back and speak to all of our um, the residents in the houses and the projects that we create to find out what, what's been successful and what hasn't and that's a really um, important part of the learning process and next slide please um, and, and that's the final slide so this is from the um, Baltic Wharf development and I think I really like this picture this is a couple of residents who've who moved in and you can see that they're really proud of, of living there. And, and I guess that's um, what we want to 
be trying to do, like Elaine said, is create places where people want to live. So thank you. Thank you very much, Rob. I think that was um, a fantastic um, look around stuff that's been done and, and why we're doing it. I think that was um, really, really interesting. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move on now to our, our, our third speaker of the day, um, Alexandra Nate. Um, we're really lucky to have Alex with us today. Um, she joins us from uh, Places for People Capital. She's placemaking and investment director there. Um, and as with our other two speakers, I feel so lucky to introduce her. She has had uh, an astonishing career, um, and it, that's not hyperbole. Um, she's uh, done uh, a lot of writing, a lot of talking. She's done a TED talk, um, and I'm not even going to run through all of her list of achievements because um, write, written down, they, they take up a lot of space. Um, and so I would rather just pass on to Alex and say, um, please do, um, tell us about your thoughts on placemaking. Um, and at this point, I think Alex was also keen to have uh, all of our attendees turn their videos back on, if you're happy to, um, because Alex doesn't have slides. So it would be lovely to see all your happy faces again. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Um, I certainly don't deserve that very kind introduction, but I'll do my best. Um, one of the things I have learned in my career is that you should never try as a fund manager to follow two extremely expert architects because my slides of boring graphs and charts will never, ever live up to the beautiful images you've just seen. So I'm going just to try and whiz through some of the points that I like to make when I talk about placemaking. And one of them is actually something that Elaine captured in her talk about the kind of the fact that there isn't a one size fits all solution. And for me, one of my pet hate questions is when I get asked, what's the model? How do we do this? Just where's the model that we can put everything into and it will spit out a placemaking solution? To which my point is, there isn't one. It's inherently bespoke. You know, there are some core principles as Rob and Elaine have outlined, but actually the, the very nature of if you're going to take this on, is it something that will take time and effort? Um, and another point that Rob highlighted for me, which I, I tend to talk about, is that you're trying to make somewhere that is too, not through. Um, but actually also that it's not something that's done to the community that's already there. And so there's a real, that sense of kind of collaboration and, and moving things on. And you can get to a huge kind of semantic debate about what's regeneration, what's gentrification and what's placemaking. But the point is it only works if you engage a community and community engagement isn't a broadcast of information of what the developer is doing. It is a participatory process. Um, and I think there are countries, you know, Hamburg, particularly in Germany, has a really excellent model that could be adopted in terms of how a community is really engaged. But one of the things from the world that I sit in, which is very much the kind of investment and the money side, is that placemaking has, has become this hugely, sort of bu the latest buzzword, in parallel with the kind of real attention around ESG. And I think that's because you've had a huge weight of institutional money, long term pension fund money, that is getting into particularly around residential development or residential led development and sort of wanting to see that the, the kind of social impact, the S that they need to tick is essentially affordable housing. So I know many of you will work in social housing as sort of entities and like us uh, where you've been approached by very large scale entities that just want a bit of money so they can get that tick and social housing seen as a very safe bet because it, you know, it, it's generally seen to be secure and kind of government backed and that kind of thing. But actually a lot of those REITs and institutions have, have had to learn quite how hard it is to deliver that kind of impact and to understand that it's not just enough just to have a tick box, that to create a place is an ongoing process. Um, I'm going to shamelessly pinch something from a colleague I heard talking this morning, Deborah Udolf at Say, and she said, there's a lot of attention in our processes, in the, particularly the planning, the design, um, the construction on place making. There's not enough attention on place keeping, on the kind of actual, the operations and the existing management of those communities. And in my background, I come up through much more of a kind of property management phase. And I think even just when I started working in social housing or with social housing colleagues to realize that it was that kind of two nations divided by a common language where you'd have housing management professionals using very specific terminology and language, which private sector property managers didn't work to the same. They were kind of talking about the same thing, but different SLAs, different terminology. And even just in that kind of management thing, creating a mixed tenure place that is just the epitome of common sense to anyone who doesn't work in our industry becomes remarkably difficult. And actually for me, that's the crux of the challenge. We have a layer of misaligned incentives in terms of delivering really effective places, whether they're brand new or they're kind of regenerating older ones. And those misaligned incentives are that you have investors who are under pressure to deliver a return, quite often in quite a short time frame, a one to three year time frame is very common in the real estate industry. That doesn't leave you a lot of time to really kind of 
start on the kind of nuances of placemaking. You have developers whose job is to build the thing and then get out of the way, frankly. And if they've done it well, they'll make a margin. And if they've done it badly, they'll go bust. It's quite a kind of high risk return kind of element. You then have the kind of operational side who, if they're lucky, get to steer some of the design and be involved in the conversation, but actually can quite often just be handed you know, buildings that may be far from perfect operationally or in a community basis. Um, and so all the way through, you, you then have the kind of legal and the planning frameworks around them, which are very focused on red lines. Um, so, and before you get into the viability challenge of things where we all know intuitively that spending a bit of time and money on place will be worthwhile. But in a viability appraisal, you can't necessarily put a number on it. There's a huge amount of work going on to try and do that in some way. And we've got lots of sort of intuitive, I know that you know we certainly internally have a methodology where we think we can allocate between six and 10% premium over time but we, we can't evidence it, evidence it in a way that we can give it to a valuer and say, put this in the appraisal. This is an uplift that we will get for doing that. So there is this block. And from, I tend to talk about the example of King's Cross, which everyone nowadays, if you, you know, if we get the luxury of traveling again and going to see those beautiful fountains where it's great with the kids running around. And you know, we have a mini version at Cabot Circus, I know, but that space for 20 years um, was objected to at every possible avenue. The council hated it. Um, a lot of kind of real local leaders hated it. Actually, Argent, the developer, were truly visionary, but everyone in the industry kind of thought, it's a nice idea, but it's just not viable to deliver that kind of mix. They should just break up the plots and deliver them individually. Actually, they supported two existing social housing communities very, very strongly, and they're still really embedded in those and included them in the development rather than shutting them out. But also that, that granary square, the fountains and that open space, they were berated by their own lawyers who said, well, you have the liability, you have the red line for this, you need to put a fence up or you need to control it in that some kind of way. And actually what they did is said, no, we want this to be open space. We want, we see that this will add value. And it's very easy to see that it does now. Um, and that project is on the cover of the council's annual report every year. But you know, for decades, it was really something that was just seen to be a crazy idea. Um, and something that Rob said that also with an international hat on, I think one of the things we have to remember is people's perception is very, very different to something that you can't tangibly show. So perceptions of density are a really, really challenging thing to get people past. So that, that hideous kind of low rise school of Los Angeles, which is kind of a weird, weird in many ways, that city. But um, I did a lot of work in Moscow for a long time and people in that city were convinced that it was incredibly dense. And when we showed the modeling of places like New York and London and Cairo, Moscow is actually incredibly dispersed but you couldn't get past this perception that they had that everything was crowding in on top of them. And I think that's the same again with placemaking, people's perception of what makes a good place or what would be nice in a space. But if you're coming from the, the tendency of the professions in real estate and development and design that tend to be kind of white middle-class, although we're trying to sort of change that, then there's a real risk that you go, oh, we're going to give you a skate park for your young people or a, you know, a multi ex kind of games area. And actually there's a great little charity in, in Froome in the Southwest called Make Space for Girls. He's done a huge amount of research to show that actually you know, that tick box does nothing. Most teenage girls are not provisioned for at all in those public spaces. They don't feel safe, they don't feel welcome. And actually there, there are really simple things you can do if you engage all of the young people in a community in the placemaking, but it's too easy to assume you know, because your perception is, oh, a skate park will suit young people. Let's have that. Um, so I'd recommend if you haven't looking them up. Um, and in, in the TED talk that um, I kindly mentioned, one of the things I banged on about was gender mainstreaming as a concept in urban design. And this kind of came out of a lot of work in Vienna in the 70s, where the city had been kind of modeled around traditional kind of men commuting by car. And not it wasn't until people started kind of tracking the movement of most of the women, realizing they were walking vast distances because there weren't sufficient safe crossing points. There weren't well-lit areas. And it's all the basic things that we know I always bang on about lose. So, you know, the, the fact that women, frankly, need to go to the toilet three times more than men in every, every average day. In Bristol, in Bedminster, where I live, the, the toilet map for Bristol was at Bedminster was a really valuable thing that allowed people to kind of have that access. But those kind of very simple public services are often just ignored or forgotten or not noticed. And so in terms of alignment and conscious, if you want to get into a conversation, because that's more interesting. But I think one of the questions that Megan asked me was, you know, how do organisations deliver this? We have seen this huge adoption of, of the focus on place, particularly by big institutions, big REITs, and you know, big fund and funders and developers like, like PFP Capital, where I sit. Um, and I think the advantage that we have is that our investors are not short termists, they're not high net worth, they are predominantly local authority pension firms and inter international kind of institutions. 
who take a very long-term view. They are investing for 25 to 30 years. So suddenly that takes away that enormous pressure to deliver a return within one to three and actually an IRR focus. And it's a much more about a yield focus. You're taking a really long-term view on what that place delivers as a whole. You can be more holistic in your approach. You can take the time to think about those decisions that in a normal circumstance would be value engineered out as a short-term cost, but actually over time will really add value. The challenge I think for the UK is that it's becoming increasingly difficult for smaller organizations to deliver those kinds of things. And actually it's a danger, I think, that it's left to the big operations to be the placemakers um, and working in partnership. I mean, as much as the local authorities do great work in terms of educating, trying to steer through local plans, that place to be evolved, actually it's only really when your money horizon lines up with your kind of place creation horizon, you can really deliver the amazing opportunity. Um, so I'm fascinated by how you can sort of push that back up the chain and try and make people think a bit differently about what does add value. Um, in a build to rent context, that's where I spend a lot of my time, the example I tend to always give people is, is about rubbish and recycling, and it's not terribly glamorous, but it's one of those things where I always, opt for any building over stick stories, I will say, put in a, a recycling sheet for rubbish. Um, vacuum sheet, they can suck it all down into a kind of the bins area, rather than asking people to take the rubbish down in the lifts or down the stairs, because the smell, the impact from voids, the fact that you know you will have to replace the carpets multiple times in a year will cost you a fortune. It tends to get picked out by a well-intentioned quantity surveyor saying oh, we can save you one or one and a half mil taking that sheet out. Actually they're impossible to retrofit into a building so when you've then completed it and you're leaving your poor old operators having to deal with the impact of people moaning you know along with acoustics it's basically rubbish management is the huge bulk of complaints about public spaces and, and co common areas in buildings and so having the foresight to turn that on. I think it's a balance between foresight and hindsight that we need to get better and braver at as an industry, asking those sort of pushy questions that say, well, okay, this does seem like it's expensive, but is it something that's a flash in the pan and we don't need it? Or is it something that could really save us money and time in the long term and actually make a better place? So Megan, I hope that's the kind of thing you wanted as a quick canter around some of the issues that I deal with. Yeah, absolutely, Alex. Thanks ever so much. I think um, at, at this point, I'm uh, going to throw throw it open to, to everybody to ask questions, whether that might be by the chat or raising of hands. Um, I'm going to kick um, kick off Q&A stage by, by saying um, top down or bottom up, asking a really broad question about placemaking. We've heard from each of our speakers today, Alex, um, Elaine and Rob, um, that there are huge tensions in place making. There's, there's money coming in at one end and there's communities feeling uh, done to at the other end. Um, how, do we, how do we further the, the place making agenda? Um, is, is this something that needs to come more consistently from, from the, the higher national government stages or is it more uh, local authority up or is it all of the um, developers at the bottom end pushing, pushing up? Um, is, is, there a, an, is there an answer to that question? And I, I open it to all of our speakers um, for views, and I know you've all touched on it. Um, does anyone have any burning response to that one? I, I could kick things off by, um, I suppose, referring back to my slides, where, when you don't have the top down side of things, you get what happens in those two examples in North America. Um, so I, I think it's, it's obviously a bit of both, but I think you do need to have the policies, the framework and the guidance in place um, to create the kind of framework to, to, to create good places. Um, because I think without that, there's a danger. Um, you don't get the quality, um, but I think it also, it, it needs to come from the, the communities who are going to be living in, in those spaces and, and around them. Um, so I think for me, it's, it's a combination of the two. I'll come in now and um, I think, I think you're, you're right, Rob. It is a balance, it's a real balance. Um, and on, with community engagement, it needs to be real. It needs to be proper engagement and not just consultation this is what's going to happen um, and the, it's about the messaging 
if you're going to do proper consultation and engagement with local authority or with, with um, local communities, you have to know what's possible because sometimes those left field ideas are way too left field. Sometimes they aren't, but sometimes they're not realistic. So you have to understand what is possible, but equally on the other side of the coin, when you get developers doing placemaking, quite often it's too watered down. So it's trying to steer that balance and figure out what it is you're trying to deliver. And if you know what you're trying to deliver, you can quite often meet in the middle. But if you don't know what you're trying to deliver, you'll have opposing views, fighting at loggerheads maybe with one another, and you may not be able to figure it out and come up with something that is actually a really good response. So for me, it's a really fine balance. But like Rob said, having those policies in place gives you a really good foundation to at least know where that bar lies. So you sort of, you can figure out whether you're below it or you're above it, or you're just pitching it and no more. Absolutely. I think um, one of the um, issues that uh, we've talked about in our, our pre-webinar discussions is um, the, the balance of uh, where policy meets reality of, of the planning system um, can often result in, in bad plate making. Uh, particularly when we, we are looking, as Alex has touched on today, on, on mixed tenure developments and the issues that arise year after year after year on, on poor houses or um, chunking the affordable housing section of the development in, in one corner or pepper potting and the management issues that arise from that. Um, I, I'd be interested, um, Alex, I know you, you've talked about that before. I'd be interested in hearing from you your thoughts on that, but also um, if anyone in, in our audience today has got any experiences, please, please do say. Yeah, so, I mean, one of the, um, I'm sure everyone will remember it, but there was a kind of infamous case in Haringey, I think it was, about a, a mixed tenure development where the, there was a playground for the for sale uh, units. And then there was a kind of behind railings, there was a strip of sort of two metre tarmac that was designated for the children of the social housing um, element of that scheme. And the bit that was entirely exasperating that the, was the local authorities sort of were forced to say, well, it was compliant with plan in some ridiculous way. There was obviously a loophole that had gone through, but it's clearly entirely unethical. But um, the flip side is that I'm, I'm involved in a lot of conversations with kind of the BPF and, and um, various local authorities, and particularly London first, looking at that kind of how you can better sort of pepper pot and, and achieve kind of mixed tenant communities and actually from a management basis it's quite often it's either local authorities or even the RPs who are reluctant to do that. So you have this kind of challenge where an institution is very happy to take as a, as a tenant, as a resident, someone on, on you know, social housing benefits or any kind of you know, support, but they want to retain control, operational control of their entire building because that's part of their investment thesis. And actually you then have an RP that says, no, no, we need to manage the units for our tenants and that's how, how we do it. So you do end up with kind of if not poor blocks or kind of poor doors, but sort of this, these divisions of floors that are different. Um, I think there are things that are being worked through and a lot of really good policy conversations to try and address that. But I think the bit that a lot of the institutional money is having to get its head around is the granularity of residential, of, you know, the operations. If you're used to asset managing offices or retail, then you know, that's essentially quite homogenous and you've got quite a lot of control of your tenants. When you're talking about people's homes, whatever type of tenancy they have or ownership structure that they have, you know, it is an entirely different ball game. And actually the regulation is vastly different. And, and it, it can often, I believe me, come as really quite a shock to a lot of the investors we talk to that they don't have the powers that they would just assume that they would have or quite how granular those kind of negotiations, those conversations need to be with residents. And so that can kind of scare the horses and people then tend to be less innovative and less bold with the place they create because they just try and go for the easy solution. And I think certainly in London, I would say you saw a lot of the core cities, part of the boom in purpose built student accommodation. And I'm saying this is an entire, this is a personal opinion, not a verified research one. But I think part of the boom in, in student housing was because it was so generous. And there were a number of developers who were bringing forward mixed tenure schemes, had a difficult time in the planning journey and panicked and just went, do you know what? Let's just get that through because we don't have to deal with the affordable challenge. We'll do it as student instead. 
Oh, absolutely. And that's, that's been my professional experience on, on a number of uh, cases. Definitely, Alex. Um, we've got a question now. Um, would you would you like to unmute and, and say hello? Is it me you're talking to, Megan? Yes, please. Sorry. <laughs> it's OK. Hi, I'm Amajit. Um, I guess this is aimed at everyone on two levels. So first of all, in, in architectural design, you have somebody, a specific um, um, discipline that looks at how you design external space, you have sustainability, etc. Well, isn't placemaking something now that's next on the agenda to look at how we build that into the design as well? Isn't, isn't that the next step? Because what we tend to do is, in everything that I've ever seen done in private sector, social housing, everything, we do it in half measures, and then we wonder why it doesn't work. <laughs> and I think part of the problem is, we shouldn't do this in half measures, that it needs to be a discipline by itself and it needs to be incorporated. And the first architectural firm that actually does this, I think they will be market leaders. Heads up, Rob, just there, <laughs> you know. So I, I actually think that that is the next step because this whole placemaking thing, it starts from the point of design. So when you look at blue zones, you touched on one in your presentation, Rob. When you look at blue zones such as Sardinia, et cetera, in Italy, all the front doors are on ground level and the living space is usually on ground level to some extent as well. And I was reading an article about those and it's about, it's a case of people walk past and see other people and wave at them. And you have that community spirit occurring as well. Whereas when I was looking at a lot of the developments that were created is garages on the ground floor and straight away that creates a barrier. And I think that's the other thing when you go to the blue zones, they have car parks on the outskirts of town. There is no car park outside your house. Nobody does it. It's all in a singular place. So people have no choice but to walk around. And, and that's how you create the community as well. So I think there are a number of key things that we can look at developing from that. And the other thing I would say, I'm going to completely disagree with you, Alexandra. I think that the private sector is motivated and driven by a singular fact, and that is how can I maximize my income? Pure and simple, that is the only thing. The reason they moved to student accommodation is because suddenly there was a lot more students coming into this country from places like China and they saw a market and they jumped on it, which is why now the market is oversaturated with student accommodation. It's, it's, it's happened in Manchester, it happened in Liverpool and it's happened, it's happened nationally across the country, even in Scotland. And, and the rollback now is, they're actually changing the use of a lot of that accommodation. So I think, I think to, to, to say that, you know, the private sector is driven by anything, but, but you know, I think is a bit disingenuous because... Uh, let's say I wasn't speaking for the entire private sector, <laughs> Amadeh, and I wouldn't pretend to do that, just the way that I don't think Elaine would say that she was speaking for the entirety of the public sector. I don't think anyone can do that. Uh, and I agree, there were points, I agree with you about the, the investors will follow, institutions particularly will follow return. What I would yeah. say is that there are a lot of investors, ourselves included, who are not driven to maximise return. We actually, I can evidence that we have done a number of schemes where we haven't done the max return thing because we've tried to create a better place. The point yeah. I was making is more, more on the planning side is that actually what's exacerbated that creation of excess student has in some cases been that the danger saved around trying to deliver mixed tenure communities and student be perceived to be easier has mean there's been even more in some places yeah no that was my point absolutely yeah and I think the only final point I'd like to leave you with is I, I saw a presentation re uh, recently um, from an organization on how do we evidence sustainability because right now there is no benchmark there is no ability to measure it so we all talk about sustainability and I'm sure we all remember those amazing CPUs and everything else that was put into large social housing um, buildings, uh, which resulted in them still running combination boilers, large plants, when the green solution never worked. And I think that that is still a massive missing gap where we evidence how, how we've actually achieved sustainability. Because um, to say you're doing it is one thing, to evidence it is quite another. I think the, um, the, the sustainability point is, is interesting, I'm not be, partly because, um, well, I, I come at it as a, as a private practitioner planner, seem to be moving into a housing association, um, but I, I know that um, in uh, my world, uh, just the, the pure planning world, looking at how we get places, planning permission, and how we then work through the, the 
very tedious system that is planning, uh, we look at sustainability and in theory, from a holistic point of view at the start, we have a policy framework which tells us that we need to consider uh, the, the three strands, economic, uh, environmental and social, um, and, and how, we, how we benchmark that um, can be very interesting. It differs completely between local authority, local authority, between counties, between regions, um, and we've got a national standard for how we look at sustainability, but how that's interpreted completely differs according to which developers looking at it, which um, local authority officers looking at it, and which, which communities assessing it on any given day. Um, but we are all meant to be pushing towards the same um, end goal. And I think one of the things that um, we chatted about in pre-meet was um, how do we make sure that placemaking isn't just about housing, and it's not just about making pretty places that people want to go to. It's not just about making sure that cars are tucked away or that gardens are big enough. It's about making sure that these places, um, and I think uh, all three of our speakers have touched on this, making sure that places give back for the long term. Um, and I think Alex actually pointed to um, a Stride for Glam publication that came out a few years ago. Um, yeah, that's the one. Um, and I, I, I did go back and read it after we spoke yesterday, Alex, and uh, the, the first, one of the first essays in there is about how do we make places economically sustainable? Um, and I'd, I'd be interested in hearing from all of our speakers, actually, on um, if, if you wouldn't mind kicking off, Rob, on how, how do we look at development as an economic booster for the communities that we're, we're doing unto and working with? if I can ask you to address such a wide question. That's quite a challenging question. Um, I think I would probably start by saying, um, talking about green space. And I think there's a lot of evidence now in terms of the benefits and the value of tree planting and green space. And I think um, in all developments, we should be looking particularly during these times to maximize the opportunity for green space. And I think that can have a huge effect on the kind of the well-being of future residents. But also if you're talking about value, the value for that for those properties and for surrounding areas. I, I just on a related point, just back to Amajit's uh, points before she's talking about kind of place making uh, approach to projects and sort of related to green space. I think one of the things that we found is that um, involving a landscape architect as soon as possible within a project, because actually it's often the landscape which really creates the place. Um, and so often on projects, they can be left sort of a bit into the process. But if we can start by creating a kind of landscape vision as soon as as soon as we can within the within the project that's the kind of the framework to creating a great place i love that rob i think that really feeds into a lot that that i hear as a planner in that is going into a lot of the work that developers are doing now that certainly as a result of um, the pandemic that we, we all lived through people are paying an, an awful lot more attention to and i certainly get a lot more commentary on where are the green spaces in development or how do we better link in places that already exist to, to green spaces? Um, Elaine, you've, you've unmuted, my lovely. I have indeed. I was just going to um, all the all the um, the overview. Rob just gives. I absolutely agree with it. And um, before I joined the council, I used to work for a couple of national house builders, who will remain nameless. Um, and my approach to projects was landscape led. The first person I would appoint was always the landscape architect. And my boss used to ask me why. And it was because if you can add, you can add the value through the landscaping. And then when I went to the second um, National House Builder to work, they'd actually done some work and looked at the extra over you got per plot by planting a tree outside. And it was something around 6,000 pounds extra. That was a couple of years ago, so it's probably changed um, from then. But that was work that they did because we, when, they, they, when they went into um, sites where they, there'd be two developers and you know, the street typologies were very different and the feeling was very different. 
the uplift in purchase prices on the greener streets, the ones that had the trees, the ones that had the bird. So effectively, the ones where you'd use more land take for things other than houses was more than the rack them and stack them developers on the other side of the um, the other side of the site. It is about landscaping, um, and but there's still, I think, an awful lot of work to be done in the industry to understand what the extra over is and what the added value is in, in money terms, because it's money terms that drive it, but then what the extra over is in social terms and the benefit that we get as communities if we live in, in, you know, in greener streets, in greener places. But again, when you think about the management of it, I think we're not very good at putting measures in place to make sure that the management and maintenance is done properly, is done regularly and is paid for. Um, of course, it's, you know, this, this development's all over Bristol and all over the, the, the country probably, where management companies are employed to do that management and maintenance, but they don't do it. And it's trying to get that balance. There are equally management companies that do a really good job, but I think we need to make sure that one, it's instigated as one of the first steps, two, it's put in, three, it's well maintained, and four, that man maintenance is well paid for and well managed. Yeah, Megan, I guess if you want me to jump in quickly, I think um, what Elaine and Lucy is, I think what I try to touch on that, you know, every large scale developer and investor that I know is trying to work their own internal calculations to that place making premium. It's just until it's in the red book, it's quite hard to get it into an, a mobility appraisal. But I think the other bit, the management, I always feel sorry for kind of managing agents and facilities managers. They're kind of the, they're kind of gotten, essentially you're moving from an area where they were supposed to, you know, manage it, collect the rent and do it as cheaply as possible. And, you know, just deal with any hassle. So actually shifting that whole thing into actually you need to curate a space and you need to engage residents. And, it, you know, it's a very different skill set that we're asking people to do and deliver on. But there are some doing it, it really, really well. Um, I want to touch on the sustainability point that Amajit made, because I think she raised some really key issues now 15 years ago I ran a research product that looked at all the different sustainability benchmarks that apply to real estate and development and there were 280 then and god knows how many more there are now and the problem you know lots of those are kind of what I would charitably call teach to the test you know pay us consultancy a your money and we will give you a magic badge that says you've done this um I think we're really really stuck in a kind of governmental situation where with the best of intentions energy performance certificates, you know, the professor who led the creation of those was on record as saying, these aren't really ideal and not really what we hope for, but hopefully it's a starting point. What that's become is the biggest aggregate data set that government has of kind of anything to do with energy and buildings, even though everyone, you know, works and it knows that it's not an accurate measure of energy performance in a building, but we now have huge amounts of policy coming out built around EPCs because it's the data set the government has. So it's a bit like turning an oil tank around in terms of those benchmarks. Amajit, what you might find interesting is that there's a load of work that's been done by the UK Green Building Council, um, also by the BPF, so I'm chairing a committee there on having some ESG guidance coming out that's not just for the investors and wanting the tick box, but actually just really practical about how do you apply good sustainability and social impact measurement to places and actually do it for the community, not just for the kind of investor return. And I think there is a recognition now that it's not enough just to say you're doing it. I think there are absolutely lots and lots of organizations who've published very jazzy kind of commitments and it's essentially, we let our staff paint a wall once a year and that's great tech. And, and there's lots more interrogation. There's actually regulation coming. There's something called TCFD, which is a task force for climate related financial disclosure. And sounds thrilling, I know, but that is absolutely changing the world that I work in because that's European legislation that also is being applied in a UK context that requires financial institutions pension funds, real estate investors to demonstrate and be very specific about what they're doing, both on sustainability and climate and also on social impact. So I think a lot of those people who've made bold claims are now going to have to really evidence it in a lot more detail. And that I would like to think would trickle down to more of what Elaine said of more people delivering it properly. I'm really sorry. We've come to the point now in our in our session where I'm going to thank all of our speakers because we are past half past one and I know several of you have other meetings out of office or out of home office that you need to go to. Um, I, I'd be delighted if you could all join me in, in thanking our speakers. I won't do a round of applause because that'll sound very 
very peculiar on my own, but a huge to, to Rob, Elaine and Alex, you've all been terrific speakers and I uh, really enjoyed, I've enjoyed the contributions you've made today. I'd also like to thank um, uh, Pridestone Nash um, and Lester Aldridge, um, a, a legal firm who both sponsored today's event. Um, this has been, um, I hope, a really useful women in social housing event for you all. If you're interested, if you're not already a member or if you have friends who aren't already members, please tell them about us. Um, and also, if you could um, fill in the feedback form that Faith has put in the chat, um, we'd be delighted to hear from you, hear what your thoughts are on today or other events you'd like us to put on. So I'm going to thank Elaine, Alex and Rob. Please feel free to disappear. For anyone else who'd like to, to stay online, please feel free. I'm going to open it up to everybody. You can stay, unmute, turn your cameras back on and, and stay and say hello to one another. So thank you ever so much, everybody.